Hello and good afternoon. Um, who knows, MongoDB be already. Who has heard the brand? Somebody, software developers here in the crowd? Some architects, open. we love to talk to architects, we love to talk to the software developers, we love to talk to product managers, because a lot of what people do is driven by data. And it's not easy to work with data. And even if you need to think about manufacturing and the companies creating great products, great hardware products, we've probably all seen that uh, a lot of these smart products are driven by software these days. So it's very crucial for companies to actually not just create great hardware, but also create great software products and combine that with the hardware to stay competitive and remain leading in the market, right? Because competitive advantage is something you cannot buy. You have to build it. And if you want to build something, and it's usually software combined with harder, talk to us and we'll probably be able to help you and I'm gonna share with you how we can help you do that. And building is not a one-time task. Building is something which keeps continuing. So you really wanna make sure that you enable your organization to, for sustainable innovation. And most of you, especially in Germany, but all across Europe and the US, GDPR, data confidentiality, if you build software as a service or products as a service, you deal with sensitive data and you want to make sure that this data is protected, that you can handle that data, you can comply with all of these complicated regulations. Um, and it, it's not an easy task. As you can see, the number was actually shown before on uh, the, the previous Google presentation as well. Many companies struggle or even fail uh, keeping up with that fast-paced um, software development and evolution environment. So why is it so complicated? Or why do so many companies fail? It's basically because a lot of it is tied to data, not having access to data, or of it being very complicated to work with data because data is locked in mainframe systems, it's in, uh, locked up in equipment, it's locked in commercial off-the-shelf tools, and you need that data to be able to build all of these fast-paced applications. Customer expects features like every day, every week. So how can you basically get access to that data? And how can you innovate quickly on top of that data? I mentioned it, the data is not for very different reasons. Some of it is just pure license models. You have a tool, the data is in that tool. And you cannot just add another hundred users to that tool. It's just too expensive. Some of those tools use rather the legacy technology and you cannot change them quickly. They're not built for that purpose to, to change and evolve over time. And so there's many different reasons. It really depends on what you have. But in some way or another, you will always face that challenge. Another challenge is that we're a database technology or a database company. And a couple of years back when we, we went to market and we were talking about introducing new database technology, customers always said, well, we already have 10 different database companies or 10 different technologies to manage data. We don't really want another technology because we already have search engines, we have relational databases, we have key value stores, mobile databases or embedded databases. And we built or we spend a lot of effort on basically integrating that data, copying it from the system of record into the search engine to create that exciting customer experience, Google search experience, for example. And it's really already super complicated. And I think I've talked a lot about the problem you probably all know already. So let's move on with how can we help? How can we make your companies or your software developers life easier? Combining data and evolving faster, building features for your customers. And I want to start quickly by introducing what is the reason that MongoDB has become so incredibly popular. So we're a NoSQL database technology. It's kind of a buzzword. But the key ingredient is the document model. The document model is literally JSON structure. And if you think about REST APIs and APIs all across the internet, the internet basically stops JSON. Sensors and JSON structures, um, business systems exchange data in JSON structures. So you have it already. So why tear it apart and split it across multiple tables? In many cases, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And with the JSON structure, you get a lot of flexibility because the schema is literally in every single record. So I can start with one structure, I can add on fields over time, I can change data types of fields, 
you don't even have to take that database down. You can do it actually while the system is up and running. And that is one of the key ingredients why we helped companies evolve much, much faster and combine different data sets inside of one technology because of that flexibility. Because the source system is always changing, right? There's a new device added, there's a new business system added. They add fields, they add attributes. How can you bring those attributes to the operational data layer at the front? So a lot of it is basically just Jason Srox's new data model. It's kind of a paradigm shift with that regards. Then another key ingredient why MongoDB is so popular is because it's built up from ground uh, with a distributed architecture in mind. If you think about how complicated it is to achieve high availability with traditional technologies, you need different frameworks, you need additional components, which are, first of all, super complicated to set up, and then they may even require you to pay additional license fees. Or you hand it over to cloud providers. MongoDB runs everywhere. You can self-manage it, or you can use it on the Google Cloud, of course. And it's built up for high availability. And secondly, you can keep on adding nodes for all sorts of different use cases. Because one of it is very uh, latency sensitive. It drives your processes. You really want to make sure that um, your business keeps running. And then you have your data scientists, your, your BI people. They want to get access to that data. And they very often also want access to live or real-time, soft real-time uh, data sets. And to not interfere with each other, we can, you can just add new nodes. You can do that while the system is up and running. And then connect your BI tool, your data science, your AIML um, tooling just to the secondary nodes without the interference of the operational workloads. Easy, no additional tooling required. It's literally just the configuration of the MongoDB node itself. And since we're here at the Google booth, we obviously want to talk about how not necessarily to run those technologies because you can get them all fully managed. And since MongoDB is more than 10 years old by now, we've also evolved much more into something which we call a developer data platform. So you have MongoDB fully managed with the key ingredient, the document model on top of it. And the beauty about the document model is literally that it's a superset of all the other data models. So you can put the table into MongoDB easily. You can use MongoDB as a simple key value store. We have query operators for graph queries. We can do joins because there's good reasons why you actually want to normalize data to some degree and then join it back together again. We have geospatial features. And one feature which we've uh, introduced two years back is um, distinct time series collections. Because we're actually super popular in IoT. If you think about equipment on the shop floors and all sorts of telemetry data, time series data, wouldn't it be cool to be able to basically store the time series data and the context information all in the same technology? With MongoDB, you can do that. And with regards to software developer performance or productivity, all of that data is accessible through a single API, through a single query. So I don't need to talk to three different systems. I don't need to learn three different query languages. I can do all of that within MongoDB directly on top of my data. So Mo MongoDB is really well suited for transactional workloads. We do have one feature, which is um, search. That's recently been introduced into our data platform. And it's literally full text search, as you know it from Elasticsearch or Solar, based on top of Lucene. So we integrated Lucene as a full text search index into the MongoDB query language. So you don't have to build any ETL workflows anymore. You don't have to duplicate the data. The data remains in MongoDB, but you can still run your type ahead, fuzzy matching, facets directly on top of your data inside of MongoDB. You can also use MongoDB for analytical workloads. And we primarily position ourselves in the space of translytical or operational analytics. We're not a data warehouse. That's where we hand over the data to other tools. But in many cases, you just want quick dashboards on top of actual operational data. You can do that with MongoDB perfectly fine. And as I mentioned it, we basically run on GCP. We run on other cloud providers as well. And you can still go and download MongoDB and deploy it, maybe on the shop floor and connect it with our tooling into the cloud. Or maybe you want to use other tooling. That's fine as well. So how do we fit into the architecture? How do we come into the picture? Talking about all these benefits you could potentially achieve with MongoDB. 
You've seen that picture before. We have on the left-hand system, the commercial of the shelf tools, the, the equipment, all of these hundreds of applications. And to really gain efficiency around software development, to be able to fulfill all these fast-paced requirements here on the, let's say, customer side, we propose to build something which we call an operational data layer. And how does that data get into the operational data layer? Well, the good thing about MongoDB is it's been so popular, so there's a lot of different tools uh, which provide connectors to actually bring in data into MongoDB. For example, Litmus over there, they have a connector for MongoDB. So you can connect your um, assets, your equipment through Litmus and then branch off the data which is, in this, uh, which is interesting for your operational workloads or for your applications you consider building into MongoDB as easy as it can get. Kafka, ETL tools, they all come with MongoDB connectors. So you have a way to basically offload some of the data or copy some of the data into MongoDB, combine different sources with each other, and then use MongoDB APIs through the MongoDB drivers directly in your code. We do have fully managed um, REST APIs with the Mongo query language. And we do also have a GraphQL API endpoint, which allows you to literally query the data all across your different data sets super fast. One thing I'm going to talk on the, in the next couple of minutes is something which is called Atlas Device Sync. And that brings us to connected products. Because if we talk about products, we talk about mobile phones, accessing a certain device, scanning information, changing my configuration of the seat on my mobile phone. And basically that should potentially automatically synchronize with my car, right? Or whatever machine I'm building. But these devices here on the left-hand side, they're very different. They're very resource constrained. This is not a public cloud where you just quickly spin up another couple of VMs or containers. So you want to make sure that you handle the resources very carefully. But still, the, the demand and the data produced by these devices it just increases. And the mobile phone is kind of similar with that regards, although these devices have become super powerful already. Cloud we talked about. And so what we basically need for these devices is something which is a low footprint. It doesn't necessarily spin up another data service, but it allows you to program and use data very efficiently in an embedded device, in a mobile phone, in a, an embedded application. And so uh, a couple of years back, MongoDB has acquired a company called Realm. And uh, Realm is an embedded database, meaning it's a library. You just import it in your code, and it provides you a sophisticated file system API. And it's gained super, uh, huge popularity. There's over 2 billion downloads. Um, there's different expressions of it. Its core is developed in C++. We now provide also a C++ um, SDK. We have .NET, Node.js, Swift, Kotlin, Flutter. All of these popular frameworks are available. And you can just import a library, 100% um, open source, and start storing data in that database. Now. There's other databases out there, like SQLite and other technologies. What's different? So just like MongoDB, Realm is object-oriented. And what does that mean, object-oriented? Well, basically, you just define your class, instantiate an object, you open a transaction, you persist that object. That's all you have to do. No ORMs required. You just literally work with objects. You access objects. You access attributes of those objects. Uh, you modify objects. You literally just work with objects, and that's what software developers want, right? You don't want any complicated uh, data transformations, etc. And so what we've done, we acquired a company. And since we had already a great data platform in the cloud, we basically integrated these two technologies with each other. So you can use Realm offline, just use the open source code to work with it. But if you're using MongoDB on the back end as well, you can easily combine these two together in a, a very um, smart, sophisticated way. I'm going to share with you how um, that can be done. So we saw that picture. Where do the technologies fit? We can use Realm in an embedded application. I'm working a lot with OEMs um, these days. Infotainment systems uh, is a popular example. It's obviously very much overlapping with what you see on the, on the mobile app space as well. And, but you can think of a wide variety of different areas where you could deploy and leverage that technology to build that. And then you can also think, well, data integration is not that complicated. 
I just send an event, I call, uh, make a REST API call, I get that data. And we often talk about the, the tip of the iceberg. Looks easy, anyone can do it. And for those of you who have started doing it, they quickly figure, well, actually it's not that easy. Because, oh, my mobile phone has very weak connectivity. Oh, I'm sitting in an airplane, but I still want to finish that task. Oh, I cannot, I hit that button, time out. And as soon as you can change data in offline on multiple devices, you really need a lot of complex code to make sure that you end up in a deterministic state once devices are connected again. And all of that code isn't really differentiating. It maybe was differentiating before we developed this solution. But nowadays, if you can get this commercial off the shelf, you can basically just focus on building the functionality on top of a sophisticated, smart data layer. So, our protocol is called Atlas Device and it provides out of the box, basically bi-directional, real-time data synchronization across devices under the offline first paradigm, meaning anything you do in the app is persisted locally first. And as soon as the device is connected in the backend, it automatically synchronizes the data and it uses operational transformation to um, resolve potential conflicts. So you as a programmer, you know exactly what state you're gonna end up with, even if the changes um, don't end up in the right order um, at these different devices. It's also very efficient for data transmission. So it does data compression. Um, transparently, so you don't have to do anything at all, does it itself transparently. And it's also very cool because it only synchronizes the changes. If you have two data sets and you just increment the value on this side, it will just send that increment command to the other side. It doesn't have to synchronize the whole data set again. So if you are paying for your customer's connectivity, like the OEMs do it, you want to make sure that you only transmit the data which is actually changing, so make it very efficient. Compression, delta, change, synchronization, all literally um, completely out of the box available. You can just go ahead and use it. And now I want to talk a little bit about data modeling because you've seen that JSON structure for many of you, hopefully. This is a very intuitive data structure to be used. And if you uh, walk around and you talk to different companies, you will actually figure that um, there's also a lot of areas where people start creating ontologies and taxonomies and trying to structure data. And they all have something in common. It's all hierarchical data structures. And if you think about the JSON structures, the hierarchical data structure as well. So if we have such a tree, we basically have a tree of objects, right? Some parent object, some components, which are objects as well, with different attributes, with lists of attributes, and then we have relationships between them, between them because we want to make sure that we know which component has which subcomponent, and so I can actually easily access all of these attributes. And since many people think that MongoDB is kind of the wild west of data because you don't have control, you can dump anything into MongoDB, it's actually not quite true because we have schema as well. We just use JSON schema. And you can see that on the left-hand side here, you can define a JSON schema to explicitly specify what your documents should look like. And you can go further because you can also specify how documents are related with each other. And that's very neat because if you have worked with GraphQL, you know that you have to build a schema to make GraphQL work. And we do that for you. So you just dump data into MongoDB. You can actually generate the schema automatically. You can obviously tweak it because whatever um, this automatically identified doesn't necessarily have to be what you want. You can create the relationships. On the side of that, you get the class definitions for the realm SDKs directly. You just copy paste it. And keep in mind, this looks simple here because we just have a few attributes. But if we talk about a real use case, you may end up with hundreds or thousands of attributes. So a neat little helper which is going to help you build the right code, less error prone, more efficiently and use that on or within your uh, specific applications as well. And the same schema, no additional work required is actually being used for the GraphQL API endpoint, which allows you to query all of these different data sets, including um, authentication down to the field level, so role-based access control down to the field level for a particular user, for a system, or for an inter internal employee who needs access to a different data, all fully managed. 
Now there was a lot of technical information. We actually do have a little demonstration. Our booth is right behind there. And um, the architecture is very simple. I have a little vehicle simulator on top left corner, which has the realm database, collects information even if the vehicle is not connected. It sends that information to the cloud backend using Atlas Device Sync, brings it into MongoDB, and then we can configure database triggers, kind of serverless functions, which then can talk to a REST API, for example, a Vertex AI model, get an inference, bring that inference back into MongoDB, and then sharing that knowledge with mobile apps or with the device itself. Because whenever I talk about this scenario, I talk about, imagine you're sitting in a restaurant, your car is about to catch fire, and the message pops up on your infotainment system. Well, you definitely want to have that information on your mobile phone as well. So you can actually do action. So a lot of different possibilities. Come to our booth. I'm happy to guide you through, talk a little bit about technology because that's what I like to do. And uh, we also have a little gimmick, uh, Rubik's Cubes for anyone who loves puzzles. Um, if you're fast enough, we'll sure get you one from us. Thank you very much for listening in and have a great event here.